Our Father in heaven, we count it a privilege to come before you this morning, praising your name, singing your scriptures, learning more about you. Lord, as we sung, sang the song this morning, we ask that you would help us to remember that we are building for eternity and that we want to be with you in heaven and we want nothing to do with this world. Lord, prepare our hearts and minds as we prepare to listen this morning and Help us to gain a blessing and help us to put it into practice in our lives that it would glorify you. Bless the speaker, Lord. Anoint his lips that we may get encouragement and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The night cometh. John 9, verse 4. Good morning. How was your 11 and a half hour break? (laughs) Good. All right, this morning we are discussing tactic number 10. Remember yesterday morning we had nine tactics out of 10, and this morning's tactic is that 10th tactic. It's a pretty important one, and one that takes quite a bit of explanation and really flies in the face of what we assume to be right and normal and conventional and, and all of those things. So sometimes some of us take, um, myself included, some more convincing. <laughs> so I devoted an entire session to this uh, important topic. We are told in the book Christian Education that parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached 8 or 10 years of age. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them what? God's great book of nature. Parents should be the only teachers until when? 8 or 10. The only schoolroom. So parent, who should be the teachers? Parents. Where's the schoolroom? Well, until 8 or 10 years of age, should be in the open air, amid the opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery, their most familiar textbook, The Treasures of Nature. These lessons imprinted upon the minds of young children amid the pleasant and attractive scenes of nature will not soon be forgotten. Does this sound like your average first grade these days? No, it doesn't. So is this old-fashioned advice that doesn't apply anymore? A lot of people say it is. But we know it's not, right? This is inspired counsel. But perhaps it would be helpful to us to understand why this is so important. So we're going to cover that tactic number 10. Maybe we should have a little test. I'll take that slide away. How many tactics do we remember from yesterday? Anyone remember the first one? Physical activity? All right, very good. The next one? Anyway, just, just name. Any you, you can think of. What was that? Overstimulation. Very good. What else? I think I heard it. Say again. Too much study. Very good. What else? Testing. Yeah. Age segregation. That one's really important. Too much technology. (laughs) Very good. Yes, we saw 10 thought-destroying tactics, a lack of physical activity, overstimulation, too much study, testing, poor health and nutrition, age segregation, television and electronics, an education chiefly of the mind, a lack of training to think, and tactic number 10. I've titled it Early Formal Academics. Early Formal Academics. I think we should approach this topic with some extra prayer, though. So will you bow your heads with me for a moment? Father in heaven, we know that your counsel is inspired, um, and we thank you for that. 
And now, Lord, as we look deeply into this topic of what children should be experiencing in the early years, um, focusing on character development, Lord, we ask that you'll guide our minds, speak through me, may I present clearly, and help us to understand your way perfectly. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Early formal academics. The story is told of a man who was strolling along a river one day, and um, he came upon another man who was frantically jumping in the river time after time after time and pulling people out of the river. And so he, was, he would stand there, and a man would come floating by, and he's gasping for breath and trying not to drown, and so the man would jump in and pull him out. And a moment later, another one would come by, and so he'd jump in and pull him out. And over and over this happened, and finally the observer said, Sir, what is causing all these people to come by drowning? Where are these people coming from? And the rescuer said, I don't know. I'm too busy rescuing them to go upstream and find out who's pushing them in. And as I thought about that, I said, wow, that's really what we often do in modern child psychology and education. We see problems. We see children struggling, drowning as if it were. And we say, oh, let's pull them out. Let's rescue them. Let's treat this problem. But do we go upstream to find out what's causing the problem to begin with? And I realize that what I'll discuss this morning is not the only source of problems, but it is a major source of problems. They did a poll, a study recently, a survey, and they looked, they compared kindergarten classrooms from 1998 with kindergarten classrooms in 2010 and 11. Because it's often said, well, you know, kindergarten, I mean, it's all about crafts and coloring and, you know, good things for kids. Is it? That's not what we're finding, actually. They asked what teachers' opinions were for what age children should learn to read. And they found that uh, in 1998 and 99, 48% of kindergartners considered reading fluently too much to expect. I would agree. That's a lot to expect out of a kindergartner. Well, 10 years later, 12 years later, sorry, the uh, teachers' opinions had changed a bit, and now only 10% felt like that was too much to ask of kindergartners. Is the landscape changing a bit in what is expected? It definitely is. They felt that uh, 29% of of kindergarten teachers felt that children should learn to read in kindergarten. 2010 and 11, now 78% of kindergarten teachers felt like, yes, children should learn to read in kindergarten. In 1998, 53% of kindergartners were in full-day kindergarten programs. And in 2010 and 11, 81% were now in full-day kindergarten programs. Again, it is, the environment is changing. Time for art and music has dwindled. Currently, well, not so currently, I guess that's seven years ago, but <laughs> the latest study I can find here, uh, 90% of kindergartners were being taught to read. 97% were composing and writing complete sentences in kindergarten. And 99% were in classes learning capitalization and punctuation. That's a lot to expect out of kindergartners, isn't it? 84% of 2010 and 11 kindergarten teachers feel that attending preschool is very important for success in kindergarten. (laughs) We could really unpack this one. I mean, is success in kindergarten the goal here? (laughs) Even if it is, I mean, they're saying that you have to go to preschool because they're anticipating or they're expecting so much out of children in the kindergarten years. They said, well, you have to go to preschool to succeed in kindergarten. Pre-entry requirements for kindergarten. Children must already know how to use pencils and paintbrushes, know most of the letters of the alphabet, and be able to count to 20 before they ever get there. They're really expecting a lot out of these young children. And the title of this study was actually, Is Kindergarten the New First Grade? Because they've just shifted everything back. And so what they used to expect in in third grade became second grade, became first grade, became kindergarten. It just keeps pushing earlier and earlier. So many administrators, parents, teachers, they're thrilled with these new developments. Society is pushing this direction. They say kids should be learning early, shouldn't they? Well, of course they should be learning early. But what should they be learning That's the question we as Christians need to ask. Is academics what they should be learning early? Or are are there other things more important? A significant body of scientific research with input from some of the top developmental psychologists and neurophysiologists 
tell us that there are some unintended consequences to what we're going to call early formal education. They tell us that while kids may be learning, they're also missing out on other areas of proper development. And they suggest that the price to pay isn't worth it. Early academics may be doing more harm than good. And the weight of research and evidence clearly suggests that an academic setting before the age of 8 or 10 is actually damaging to the mind, and I believe from research, one of Satan's master tactics for capturing the minds of our children and pushing them into his way. How? How and why? Well, let's get into a little bit of brain science this morning. Does anyone know what this is? A neuron. Very good. That is what your brain is made out of, more commonly known as a brain cell. It's what your brain uses for all of its functions, including listening to me right now, if you are. You were born with about 100 billion of these neurons, but you don't have that many now. And that's a compliment, because the brain goes through a process. Uh, It can't just stick with this pile of neurons, and it goes through a process of pruning, where it pulls out and it realizes that, you know, some of these neurons, I haven't used these for 10 years, and so it gets rid of those. And so the whole process of childhood is one of specialization. It lends more efficiency to the brain. Uh, The brain in an early age is not very efficient, but as we get rid of the unneeded neurons and focus on the ones that are used in daily life, that makes the brain more efficient. That's why it's very important that children have the right types of stimulation and the right environment in their early ages, because that's training the brain to keep those neurons of whatever the experiences were in childhood. The neurons must connect to each other, though, and uh, this is done by uh, the building of uh, synapses. And just as an amazing fact, at peak periods of development during childhood, as many as 1.8 million synapses are formed per second. It's incredible growth. The brain triples in size in the first three years of life. But then, as the neurons begin to specialize, organize, and mature, they undergo a process called myelination. Myelin is an electrically insulating material that coats the axon of the neuron and it speeds information transfer. So we see the myelin sheath over here on the axon of the neuron. That is speeding the information transfer by about 100 times. So a myelinated neuron is about 100 times faster than an unmyelinated neuron. A myelinated neuron is usable. An unmyelinated neuron is not so usable. In fact, so inefficient that the brain generally tends to avoid using unmyelinated neurons. This, when we talk about brain development and we say the brain is maturing and developing, we are in, I mean, we're talking about a few processes there, but one of the main ones we're speaking of is myelination. When an area of the brain becomes ready to use, it's becoming myelinated. Is that clear? Tracking with me so far? Okay, good. Trying to force information transfer over an unmyelinated neuron is a rather futile effort. Uh, Asking an undeveloped brain section to perform a task for which it's not prepared and developed for yet can lead to problems. We'll get to more on this in just a moment. The myelination process occurs in stages and on a fairly set schedule. So at birth, all but the most essential bodily functions are unmyelinated. They are not developed yet. Let's look at a brief schedule of development. I'm not going to get into every one of these aspects, um, but we'll start with conception to 15 months. We have very basic brain development. 15 months to four and a half years, limbic system and relationship. Those areas of the brain are developing and myelinating during this age. This is why it is so important that the little children and toddlers are with their parents, especially their mother, as much as possible all the time, really, because that is the time the limbic system is the emotional area of the brain. Emotional security is built in the first very few years of a child's life. And the relationship centers, how they relate to others, is uh, developing during this time. Now, from four and a half to seven years, we begin to see a gestalt or right hemisphere, elaboration, elaboration, myelination, development, some terms there used a bit uh, synonymously. So right hemisphere is myelinating from about four and a half to seven years. Now, that's in girls. Boys have a slower growth period. I didn't say boys were slow. 
<laughs> a slower growth period, uh, they take longer to develop the right hemisphere, usually around two years difference. So we can say four and a half to seven years in girls, about four and a half to nine years in boys. Now you say, why did God make it so that boys developed slower? They just developed differently. That's not a matter of slowness. We know that the right hemisphere is very important for spiritual understanding. What was God's purpose for men, for boys? Spiritual leaders of their families, right? Two extra years to develop this area of the brain important for spiritual strength. Isn't that amazing? God knew what he was doing there. And then at about, this is not a stage, the seven to nine years, left hemisphere myelination, that's not a period of time. This is a beginning stage. The left hemisphere continues uh, myelination for quite a long time. So at about seven years in girls and at about nine years in boys, we see the right hemisphere beginning development, um, rather beginning a, a surge of myelination. At about eight years, we see the frontal lobe beginning myelination and um, I'm going to stop with those three areas that I'd like to focus on this morning. All areas of the brain affect development. There are parts of area, different areas of the brain developing all the time. You know, it's, it's hard to break it down into a list and say, well, the left hemisphere is doing absolutely nothing until nine years old. No, <laughs> that's not correct. But as a general rule, you know, surges of myelination and growth and development are happening on this time schedule. And so we'll focus this morning on the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere, and the frontal lobe. Those are very important brain areas in our discussion of what children should be learning in the early years of life. The left hemisphere generally deals with things such as detail, parts and processes of language, linear patterns, logic, critical thinking, numbers, and reasoning skills. Now, before you say, well, wait a second, I thought some of those skills were in the right hemisphere. I thought they were in this hemisphere or this area of the brain. Yes, we, it's not that we don't see some of these areas in other parts or skills, functions in other parts of the brain. But the left hemisphere is a primary processing center for these areas, for these skills. The right hemisphere tends to deal with things such as images, rhythm, emotion, intuition, imagination, creativity, feeling, faith, and belief. And again, the brain is very connected. It's a myth that, well, this person's right brain. They only use the right side of their brain now. <laughs> you know, we use our whole brain. There's an enormous, a healthy brain, I should say, has an enormous amount of connection between the hemispheres. They help each other. They work together. But we still have primary processing centers. And so as we look at these two hemispheres, we see a distinct pattern of sort of tasks and activities that these hemispheres are good at. Now, looking at these two lists, comparing the types of things in these two lists, which side of the brain do you think, if you could take a guess, would be most important for the sit-down, learning out of a book type of, type of academics that we usually ask our children to do? Left hemisphere, very good. The detail, the language, the linear patterns, logic, numbers, reasoning, those things, you, that's part and parcel of academic study as we know it. Left hemisphere is very needed. Again, you'll use the right hemisphere in academic study, definitely. I'm not saying it's either or, but you definitely need that left hemisphere in academic study. Also, we'll skip over to the frontal lobe and specifically the primary motor cortex located right there in, in the red area of the brain on the diagram. Fine motor development is um, often um, primarily controlled by the primary motor cortex. Any ideas what fine motor development would be important for in an academic setting? Writing, very good. Handwriting, very important. Inner speech, this is crucial for internalizing concepts in reading. So when you read something, you're probably not saying it out loud to yourself, um, although we notice that children do this, right? Uh, that's because in children, I'll get to more of that in a moment, but the inner speech development isn't occurring until later. And so it's very important for academic learning. And then foveal focus and fine motor eye teaming is essential for reading. A page is two-dimensional, and we find some control for this in the primary motor cortex. So let's go back to this schedule. The left hemisphere, beginning myelination between the ages of seven and nine, while the right hemisphere organizing and myelinating from about four and a half through age seven to ten in girls and even up to ten or twelve in boys. 
Do you see a problem? Definitely a problem here. That left hemisphere, very needed for academic learning, hasn't really begun that surge of development until around the ages of seven to nine. What's the brain going to do? The, we're asking it to perform this task where it needs the left hemisphere, but that's not really fully developed yet. What's going to happen? Also, the primary motor cortex, containing some functions very important for academic learning. In the frontal lobe, begin organization around eight years of age. And we know that the frontal lobe develops um, into the late 20s. Um, so this is a, a long developing area of the brain. But it's beginning around eight. So what's the typical school starting age? Five, four. Five, four? Depends on the state. Some states actually start preschool at 18 months, and they're jumping right into these uh, things that are helping them prepare for kindergarten, which we just saw a few minutes ago, was asking you know, the same things that they used to ask in first and second grade. <clears throat> but any of these ages, even if it's age six for starting school, any of these ages are really before that left hemisphere has had a good start on myelination. So what happens when we give children the academic study before these brain regions are developed? It affects the mind. What happens when we ask that brain to perform a task for which it's not ready? Can we accelerate learning? We like to think we can, and we've tried pretty hard <laughs> in modern society. But as it turns out, a lot of damage is done because asking that undeveloped brain section to perform a task for which it is not ready, can actually do damage to the unmyelinated brain. And let's assess some of that damage. Let's first understand the concept of neuroplasticity. Young minds are very moldable and flexible, and a child's brain is designed by God to allow them to adapt and change according to the environment that they are placed in at an early age. They learn as they go, and it literally, the environment of the child literally shapes the development of the brain. Now, this is a great blessing for parents, right? We can shape the brain to be a, a, a strong spiritual character and to work for the Lord and many of these things that we can do early on in life. But it's also a huge responsibility, is it not? The amazing plasticity, though, also allows the brain to compensate for damage, such as a brain injury, by supplementing other neurons or even entire brain regions in the place of ones that are missing. Um, there have been various studies where people have had parts of the brain taken out, and before long, they're functioning semi-normal because another area of the brain begins to step in and help out the part that was removed. But the problem is they are not as, the replacement regions are not as efficient as the one that developed from birth for that specific task. I was talking with a neuroscientist, uh, neurosurgeon actually a couple of years ago and he said he was telling me he said look I can pull this part of your brain out and he said as long as uh, I didn't take out too much <laughs> and did the surgery right he said pretty soon other parts of your brain would fill in and uh, other people might not even notice that you have that missing brain region and I was like wow that's really neat he said but hang on it, it's not quite that simple he said that your replacement brain regions would never be as efficient as the one that developed from birth because the brain develops um, so much as a whole and learns around the environment that it's given that when we disrupt that, it can cause problems. And now that we understand the concept of neuroplasticity, though, of the brain beginning to supplement different regions, we can understand how that may begin to cause trouble when we try to force the academic study. Let me put this in a nutshell. If a task is asked of the brain for which the corresponding region is not matured, it will form neural routes through lower, more developed sections, resulting in almost permanent organizational damage. Is that clear? If you take nothing else from this session this morning, this is the part to really understand. If we ask the brain to perform a task for which the correct region has not matured, it begins to form neural routes through other areas because of neuroplasticity. It says, I don't have that correct region. The left hemisphere, it's not there yet. Let's try to use something else. And so it forms neural routes through lower, more developed sections. Now, it's specifying lower, more developed sections because we're speaking of early childhood. The first areas of the brain are the lower 
thinking centers of the brain. Um, the first areas to develop, sorry, are the lower thinking centers. And so we're asking this higher thinking center to perform a task. It's not ready yet, so it forms neural routes through lower thinking centers, creating an almost permanent organizational damage. Trying to force a child to learn a concept for which he or she is not ready can actually do damage to the unmyelinated brain. This is an actual physiological occurrence in the brain. Now, these are my words. Are you following so far? Okay, I see a few deer in the headlights out there. Uh, I know it's early. These are my words, though. This is my explanation. Let's turn to some brain science. Dr. Jane Healy, again, explains it quite well. Before brain regions are myelinated, they do not operate efficiently. For this reason, trying to make children master academic skills for which they do not have the requisite maturations may result in mixed up patterns of learning. And she puts it clearly here. If the right brain system isn't yet available or working smoothly, forcing may create a functional organization in which less adaptive, lower systems are trained to do the work. She calls this functional organization. I prefer the term functional disorganization because really this is not the organization that God has designed for the brain from the beginning. Trying to drill higher level learning into immature brains may force them to perform with lower level systems and thus impair the skill in question. Do we want to be impairing children's future skills? Not at all. And we run the risk of doing that though as we force them to perform. Any learning that has to be pushed into a child may end up doing more harm than good. Plunged daily into the fire of inappropriate expectation, children's early promise shrivels and non-learning becomes a habit. They may be labeled, treated, exhorted, and eventually tutored, but the basic issue remains unchanged. The school and the child are on different schedules. And that's really the issue that we're facing, the school and the child on different schedules today. And um, as someone said, it was Catherine <laughs> that said um, a couple of evenings ago, doing school at home. When we do school at home, we can still have the school and the child on different schedules, right? We need true education in the home. True education will follow the schedule of brain development that God has laid out. And I, I do want to just clarify here, it may appear that a child is doing fine. They may be seeming to be learning these subjects just, just fine. They're catching on. They're bright. Um, and that's true. They may seem like it. But the damage is being done nonetheless, and many times we don't notice that the damage has been done until much later on. And so we need to take on faith that the Lord has said, until 8 or 10, the best schoolroom is outside in the great book of nature. <clears throat> um, actually, before I get to this, let me just use a simple example. Uh, we all know maybe a basic math problem. Let's say we know that 2 plus 3 equals 5. It is, right? 2 plus 3 equals 5. So uh, we also know that, suppose I had a, uh, two apples here, and I placed three apples over here. How many apples would I have? Five apples. Functional disorganization is a bit like knowing that 2 plus 3 equals 5 on paper, but not understanding the concept of two objects and three objects combining to make five objects. Does that make sense? So we see students doing well. They're getting A's on their test because they've learned. When I write this down and I see 2 and 5, two, 2 and 3, I write down 5. They can get it on paper, but when it comes to the deeper understanding of the concepts, we're handicapping them in that area. And as uh, Dr. Healy explains well, many children that seem, uh, sorry, many things that seem ridiculously obvious to adults are not clear to children. We can explain until we're blue in the face or we can insist the child memorize what we want her to know and wonder why she's forgotten it the next day. One task that is difficult for primary students is the missing addend, so popular in early math books, 3 plus 1 equals 8, for example. Teachers and parents alike are frustrated because at this age, most students can learn to perform the operation only by rote. The minute they have to remember or organize it themselves, they forget because they never really understood it. We want children to really understand what they're learning. And I'll get to more of that in a minute. Um, so let me move on to, uh, we, have to, we have to grab this one here as we're talking about functional disorganization. Anyone seen every, any crooked trees in the woods recently? <laughs> we run across those all the time, right? When was the tree bent? Now when it's big? No, no when it's young. 
And that is a beautiful illustration the Lord has given us of the development of a child's mind. The disposition and habits of youth will be very likely to be manifested in mature manhood. You may bend a young tree into almost any shape you choose, and if it remains and grows as you have bent it, it will be a deformed tree and will ever tell of the injury and abuse received at your hands. You may, after it has had years of growth, try to straighten the tree, but all efforts will prove unavailing. It will ever be a crooked tree. We need to be ever so careful with those young minds, those young little trees, to bend them and shape them into the correct shape before they get old. But now, let's move on to another very important topic to consider when it comes to school starting age, reading, uh, doing, doing close-up work, Eye teaming. Let's look at the development of the eyes. Eye teaming is that ability to use both eyes to focus on a subject. Foveal focus is two-dimensional focus. Do you think you might need both of these functions for, say, reading? To both eyes to focus on a subject? Yeah, we need that for reading. Two-dimensional focus. Is a page uh, of text three-dimensional or two-dimensional? It's two-dimensional. We need foveal focus for reading. These functions don't fully develop until approximately age nine. We also know that less than 5% of vision actually occurs in the eyes. Now you're saying, wait a second, what are my eyes for? (laughs) The eyes are the lens for the brain. And for full vision to occur, information from all cerebral lobes must be accessed. What about if all cerebral lobes are not developed yet? Therefore, full vision cannot be occurring, right? Before the age of seven, if we look at the physical development of the eye, the ciliary bodies in the eye that control the shape of the lens are short to allow maximum three-dimensional, peripheral, and distance vision. And then after age seven, the ciliary bodies begin to lengthen to allow for more foveal vision. Also, the eyeball is not completely shaped with collagen fibers until approximately age nine, so it's very flexible. And I'll get into why that's a problem in just a moment. And so as a result of these factors, periods of reading without relaxing the focus into the distance can cause inflammation and enlargement of the eyeball, which leads to myopia or nearsightedness. Myopia and nearsightedness has become an epidemic. We read in Dr. Raymond Moore's work that even though a single clear visual image may be received by the eye, A child may still not be able to decode printed material because of deficiencies in organization and interpretation in the central nervous system due to lack of maturation. He's basically saying, look, the child can see it. It's not that they're blind. But when it comes to understanding it, there's some deficiencies in organization in the central nervous system because it's just not mature yet. There's nothing wrong with the child. They're just still maturing. When it comes to nearsightedness, though, the rate of nearsightedness in the U.S. has increased 66% since the 1970s. Can you think what other things have increased since the 1970s? I can think of two things that have changed a lot in our society. One is media use. We know that the screen is very damaging for the eyes. And the other, the push for early uh, Head Start programs, early childhood education, preschool programs, you name it. We're pushing that close-up work for children. Rates of myopia, difficulty seeing distant objects, are soaring. The trend is matched in many other countries, causing eye doctors to wonder what could be causing the decline in human vision. Currently, in the U.S., we are about 50% myopic. That's pretty bad. (laughs) I'm not sure we should be proud of that. But that's not as bad as it gets, because in East Asia, it's about 90% myopia. Seoul, Korea is 96% myopic. Scientists have long wondered, what is causing this rapid increase? For years, they have said that myopia was genetic. Now, while genetics do play a role, recent research has shown that genetics are only a small factor. But still today, you go to your eye doctor. Do we have any eye doctors here? I better be careful. (laughs) Most eye doctors, if you go to them and you say, Doc, uh, why am I getting this myopia? You know, it's genetic. There's probably nothing you can do about it. Genetics play a role, yes, but they did a study in Alaska. Shortly after Alaska became a state, it started requiring schooling for its children. And they did a study of Eskimo families, and they compared children, the the children that had now were in the generation going to school, 
with the parents and grandparents who had not gone to school, at, at least not at the early age of compulsory schooling of age six, I think it was. And so they found that uh, 60% of the children were myopic. And they said, wow, if myopia is genetic, we should be finding a similar rate in the parents and grandparents, right? Here's what they found in the parents and grandparents. Do you see it there? <laughs> Less than 1%. It almost did not exist. And they said, well, there goes the genetics theory, because that can't happen so quickly. That's not genetics to have it from the parents to the children. So they said, well, what is causing this? If we look around the world, the rates of myopia are consistently higher in more schooled and academic regions than in the ones who are more rural or non-schooled. So the U.S., 50 percent. East Asia, 90 percent. Is there a difference in how Asian countries approach schooling compared to America? Yeah, definitely is. Uh, I think the average Asian student in, I should say, in Asian countries, students spend on average twice the amount of time in homework than American students do. Just for example, they spend more time in class often also. Compare this, though, to Africa, a continent that is primarily indigenous. Yes, we do have uh, a move towards cities in some areas in Africa, but overall, uh, people are spending a lot of time outside and not quite as schooled. As best they can tell, it's between 10 and 20 percent myopia. Any correlation here? Quite possibly. They did a study in Brazil. In the city of Natal, the uh, rate of myopia was 13.3 percent. That's pretty low, yes, but what was interesting is they compared the rate of myopia in the city, <coughs> sorry, in the city with the indigenous tribes around the city, 2.7% in the indigenous tribes around the city. So they're saying, well, there's something about the lifestyle here that is creating the myopia. We know that time spent studying, looking at things up close, this applies to um, reading. It can also apply to crafts. Be careful about too many crafts, coloring, things like that. Um, we don't want to strain the eyes. <clears throat> but all types of close-up work can damage the eyes. But we also know, know that uh, the time they spend outside can contribute to the development of myopia. Children who spend less time outside are at greater risk of developing myopia. They did a study in Taiwan, and they asked children to... Uh, sorry, they asked two schools. They had two schools in the same neighborhood, and they asked one school, hey, send your kids outside for 80 minutes every day. 80 minutes. Have some outdoor recess. The other school, they said, keep your schedule as normal. Don't do your outdoor recess program. At the end of one year, at the school who had sent their children outside, 8% of the children had myopia. The school who did not send their children outside, 18%. Just the only difference in their studies and the general genetic um, pool and all of those things were generally the same. The only difference was the amount of time they were spending outside. Now, of course, part of the reason for this is the time spent looking at the objects um, that are close up when you're indoors versus when you're outside. You're looking at things that are more distant than text on a page. But scientists have also found that the bright light we experience outside is actually beneficial to the eyes. To understand this, we need to understand myopia, what the physiology of myopia is. So a normal eye on the left of our slide is very rounded in shape with the focal point right at the back of the eyeball. What happens, though, as myopia develop, uh, develops is that the eyeball begins to elongate. And so we see the uh, myopic eye on the right-hand side, and it changes the focal point to farther up in the eyeball, and therefore the vision in the distance becomes blurry. We become nearsighted. That is, in a nutshell, the process of the development of myopia. So what does light have to do with this? According to the Journal of Nature, in an article titled The Myopia Boom, light stimulates the release of dopamine in the retina. Dopamine in the retina. I thought that was a neurotransmitter. It is a neurotransmitter, but they also find retinal dopamine in the eye. Light stimulates the release of dopamine in the retina, and this neurotransmitter, in turn, blocks the elongation of the eye during development. Did you catch that? The elongation of the eye, that's what myopia is. Light causing the release of dopamine in the retina, blocking the elongation of the eye. 
Retinal dopamine is normally produced on a diurnal cycle, ramping up during the day, and it tells the eye to switch from rod-based nighttime vision to cone-based daytime vision. Researchers now suspect that under dim, typically indoor lighting, the cycle is disrupted with consequences for eye growth. And so according to epidemiological studies, Ian Morgan, who's a myopia researcher at the Australian National University, says that children need to spend around three hours per day under light levels of at least 10,000 lux to be protected against myopia. How many hours a day? Three. That's a lot of time outside for the average child now who's in preschool and kindergarten. They're not, most children are not spending that much time outside. This 10,000 lux, though, what is 10,000 lux? How much light is that? Lux is a measurement, uh, as best I can understand it, I am not a physicist, but as best I can wrap my mind around this, lux is a measurement of the volume of light. So if you could, like, scoop up the light into a box. Um, So if we imagine that we stand by this window over here, you might get 10,000 lux at the window. But if we come in, that same volume of light is now being dissipated into the room, and the lux measurement becomes, uh, begins to go down. That's, in a nutshell, the um, explanation of what lux is. And so, if we go outside on a bright, sunny day and stand in the shade, you're getting about 10,000 lux. So it's not full sunlight. I don't say you should go look at the sun for the benefit to your eyes. That will not help your eyes. But on a bright day outside, like it is right now, you're probably getting about 10,000 lux. Anyone like to guess what the average well-lit classroom is? Maybe like in here, it's pretty well-lit in here. How many lux do you think, on average, we're getting inside this room? Was it? Maybe 100. Maybe 100? Kind of pessimistic. (laughs) What was that? 500. Absolutely right. 500 lux. A big difference there in how much light we're getting just by coming inside. I was doing a seminar in New Zealand recently, and um, I mentioned this, and a man said, well, hang on, no, because here in New Zealand, uh, it's required that we have at least 700 lux in offices. I said, great, (laughs) but that's not (laughs) 10,000. We need 10,000 lux. It's pretty hard to get that indoors. The eyes need to actively experience the world as a whole for vision to develop fully. And I could get into um, several stories that I know of. I'll mention one uh, just briefly. I had a friend who, um, the mother told me the story of her daughter who was about 11, I think, 10 or 11. And uh, she had severe myopia and her eyes were getting progressively worse. And she was going for yearly checkups to the eye doctor. And one year, I believe she was 11 or 12 when she came to the doctor and the doctor said, well, at the rate it's going, Um, Within a couple of years, probably, you will be legally blind. Can you imagine getting that news as a 12-year-old? She was pretty devastated, of course. Uh, Her mom asked the doctor, though, and said, hang on, what's causing this? Why does my child have this severe myopia? What do you think the doctor says? It's genetic. You have bad eyes. Your husband has bad eyes. She's going to have bad eyes. Well, thankfully, the mother wasn't satisfied with that. She did some research. She came across the studies here about spending two or three hours outside every day. She said, well, it's not going to hurt. And then she thought about it. She said, actually, maybe this is the reason. Because she says her son has very good vision. And if it's genetic, her son shouldn't have the good vision he has, while her daughter has very bad vision. So she thought about the lifestyle. She said, of course, my son practically lives outside. You can't get him inside. Whereas her daughter practically lived inside and hated going outside. (laughs) She said maybe there's a connection. So it became a family rule, much to her daughter's um, (laughs) disdain, that uh, she had to now go outside for at least two hours every day. They lived in Florida, so there was good weather there. It's a good thing they didn't live in my home state of Michigan. Um, And I believe it was six months later, they were back at the eye doctor, expecting to receive some bad news again. But the eye doctor looked at her eyes and said, They're the same as they were six months ago. Your myopia hasn't progressed. And she said, hmm, okay. So they didn't tell the eye doctor what they were doing, and they went back home. And uh, a year later, they were back, and the eye doctor said, your eyes are are the same as they were. In fact, it might be getting a little bit better, which is not supposed to even be possible. 
And they said, well, you know, we're on this new program, and uh, we're spending time outside. We've heard about research that they, that may be good for the brain, uh, good for the eye development, stopping the development of myopia. And they asked the doctor, you know, do you think that has anything to do with it? And the doctor said, no, definitely not. There's no connection there. <laughs> I think there was, right? Because God's methods always work. And I could share other stories, actually. I have a friend who um, started getting some myopia in, in one of her eyes, actually. And we also know... Let me back up and explain one other thing. If we look at this diagram here, we know that distance vision is the relaxed state for the eye. When you're looking into the distance, that's comfortable for the eye. When you focus up close, the muscles have to pull on the lens to bring that close-up vision into focus, close-up object into focus. So what can happen is repeated um, pulling on that lens begins, if I can show right here, on the edges of the lens, we have the ciliary muscles over on this side. The ciliary muscles on the edge of the lens right there. Those are the ones that pull on the lens and flatten it out to allow for more um, close-up vision. What can happen, though, as I mentioned, up until age 9, the outer layers of the eye are not firmed up very well until, uh, again, about age 9. And so as those muscles are constantly pulling on the lens with the close-up work, it begins to stretch the outer layers of the eye and that's causing the elongation of the eye. And what's worse is, you know, when we start to see myopia, typically corrective lenses are given, you know, glasses are given. That can often make the problem worse, though, because from the eye's perspective, putting, a, putting glasses on brings the object closer. And so it just exacerbates the problem. You've got to, and so, you know, I mean, we see this. You get glasses when you're young, and pretty soon you have to get stronger glasses, and that just continues on. So um, that is one of the factors in, uh, in causing myopia. And so I've, I've um, done some research on is whether it's possible to actually correct that in early childhood. And we believe that it may actually be possible as long as corrective lenses are not given and as long as we completely remove all close-up work, I mean all close-up work, for months and focus on distance vision for months at a time, that can actually begin to allow the eye to um, shape back to a, its good state if we're doing it at an early enough age. So there is hope if you've done too much close-up work already. But moving on here, time is ticking. Let's move on to physical activity. I mentioned this yesterday, but uh, again, children are not getting the physical activity that they need when we're placing them in school. The cerebellum, formerly thought to only control movement. Now we know it's responsible for learning and cognitive activity. It is a processing center for both movement and learning, controlling functions uh, in the frontal levels of the brain. It helps with the ability to perform repetitive activities automatically like handwriting, memory, spatial perception, attention, emotion, nonverbal cues, decision-making, higher thinking abilities, cognitive skills, language, social interaction, and music a long list of very important functions that the cerebellum helps with. How do we help develop a cerebellum, the cerebellum? Physical activity. Physical activity greatly aids in the development of... Go back? Sure. Uh, some people wanting pictures of this slide. <laughs> Physical activity aids the development of the cerebellum. It is necessary for the development of the cerebellum. Uh, physical activity has also been found to enhance the growth and build greater connections between the neurons. Uh, briefly here, there's something known as the proprioceptive system, which is that sense of the body in space. And in order for a child to be able to sit still, pay attention, and visually remember the shapes of letters and numbers, a.k.a. kindergarten, right? <laughs> sit still, pay attention, remember letters and numbers. In order for that to happen, the child first needs to have developed his or her proprioceptive system, which is a sense of the body in space. How do they develop that system? Physical activity, whole body physical activity. There's also something known as the brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. When we exercise, our working muscles send chemicals into our bloodstream, causing the release of a brain chemical known as BDNF. BDNF is required for myelination to proceed. Do you think that's important? <laughs> we saw earlier about the process of myelination. BDNF, at a chemical level, is required for myelination to even proceed. How do we get BNF? BDNF? Physical activity. So if we do a little bit of logic there and combine those two, 
physical activity is required for myelination to proceed. Also, elevated levels of BDNF during the early stages of myelination increase the speed and extent of the final process. Literally, children will learn better and more thoroughly, uh, have better, uh, more thoroughly developed brains if we allow them plenty of physical activity. Is this new research, though? <laughs> what did we read in Christian education? Small children should be left as free as lambs to do what? Run! Run. Whole body physical activity. Run out of doors to be free and happy and should be allowed the most favorable opportunities to lay the foundation for sound constitutions. Another area damaged by early academics is that of language. Language development um, occurs best when a child is free to talk out loud. Has anyone with little children noticed what the little children are doing when they're playing? Often talking, right? Talking, maybe they're even playing by themselves. If you watch a little child playing by himself, a lot of times he's talking to himself. Why? That's because he doesn't have what's known as inner speech developed very well. You, as an adult, have the ability to think through something without having to say it out loud. Um, (laughs) Most of us. Some of us still talk out loud. (laughs) I catch myself doing that. (laughs) But most of us have that that well-developed ability of inner speech. But children don't. And so literally, to think... They have to say it out loud. And so when we tell them to sit still, sit still and be quiet, we are quashing their ability to think. Uh, and part of the reason for this is it's mainly controlled by the frontal lobe and the primary motor cortex. And so that's not developing until around age 8 or 10. Dr. Healy tells us that good language, just like the synapses that make it possible, is gained only from interactive engagement. What kind of engagement? interactive. Children need to talk as well as to hear. But what are they getting in school? Just hearing. They're just being talked to and not with. I am convinced, Dr. Healy says, that a reason so many students today have difficulties with problem-solving, abstract reasoning, and writing coherently is that they have insufficiently developed mechanisms of inner speech. That can easily either be because they're young and it just hasn't developed yet, or because it may have been damaged because we've quashed it at an early age. Children's brains are bombarded with too much noise and overprogramming. That can hinder the development of inner speech. Children need to be shown how to develop inner speech through individual adult attention as an adult talks with them through a situation. And children also need that uh, chance to talk to themselves to develop inner speech. Inner speech is very important for many things, um, not the least of which good language development, many reading skills, Many academic processes are very uh, dependent on good inner speech abilities. It's also very important for behavior management. How many of you want well-behaved children? (laughs) Only two or three of you. (laughs) Okay, great. Most of you. So develop those inner speech abilities. Another problem we see with early formal academics is learned helplessness. Put very simply, the child who is required to learn things before he is ready may quickly tire of them. Or he may become anxiety-ridden and so frustrated he will not try at all. I often wonder how many children decide they are dumb about certain subjects when the truth is that someone simply laid on the learning too soon in a form other than the one they needed to receive it in at the time. We overwhelm the brain with tasks that are too difficult for the brain at the time. Later on, can they learn it? Well, absolutely. Our brains are capable of incredible things. But at a young age, they're not ready for certain subjects. And so when we push it into them, we are creating this response in the brain where pretty soon the brain just gives up. And often that's subconscious. We might not notice it right away, but often we notice it after the damage has been done. I'm going to, to have to move quickly here because we are running out of time. Oh, this is sad. I need to read this one. Young children believe that adults are all-knowing and all-wise. Sometimes they lose this in the teenage years, but uh, (laughs) if we culture that at an early age, they don't have to go through that in the teenage years. That's a separate talk. Young children believe that adults are all-knowing and all-wise. When we confront them with tasks for which they are not ready, such as tests, workbooks, and homework, these children blame themselves for failure. If this all-wise, all-knowing person tells me I should be able to do this and I can't, there must be something wrong with me. We're sending too many children to school only to learn they are too dumb to be there. 
Learned helplessness is a major cause of learning disabilities. It can transfer into other areas of life. Do you want your children to take on a learned helplessness approach to Bible study? No. We need to be careful about this. Not always obvious until the damage is done. I need to move on here. Socialization. This is another um, major factor because it's often said, well, children need to go to school early for proper socialization. We covered that pretty well yesterday in the topic of age segregation. That age segregation is actually damaging to good socialization skills. And in fact, placing children with children of the same age often has the opposite effect as intended. They learn how to socialize with their peers, but not with the real world and with adults. <clears throat> we have to remember we're raising children to be adults, not to, be, not to remain children. Now, more than that, more than just socialization, though, The effects of the loving, individual, adult attentiveness in early childhood cannot be overestimated. And uh, when we separate the child from their mother, from their parents, by sending them off to school, we have damaged the emotional stability of the child. Um, uh, I'm out of time. I want to tell a story, but I have to move on here. We, we understand, we used to think, sorry, that we had the sort of the emotional area of the brain and the cognition area of the brain, you know, and we had to focus on the EQ. We also had to focus on the IQ. We now realize, though, these are very, very connected. We also know that for a child to be able to learn academically and tackle new concepts, they need a strong um, emotional attachment and a healthy um, emotional understanding. They need to be That's the word I'm looking for. They need to be emotionally secure. That's the word I was looking for. And that if the child is not emotionally secure, they begin shutting off the other areas of the brain because they need to focus on that. It's it's almost a basic survival need for a child. And so we will hinder academic learning by not giving them the emotional security they need early in life. A child relates to people and to the world primarily through interaction with parents or parent surrogates. Even the best daycare cannot completely neutralize the negative social, emotional, and cognitive effects of mother-child discontinuity. When the child is allowed to develop a strong bond with an adult, especially a parent, a much more emotionally stable and socially competent child will be the result. Do we want emotionally stable and socially competent children? Of course. They need that strong bond with an adult. What about memory skills, though? Don't children have to go to school to learn how to memorize things well? Isn't that an important life skill? I suppose we could argue whether that's a necessary life school skill. I think it is important, though, to learn how to remember things. We want to memorize scripture uh, and, and remember important things about life without having to look them up all the time. So is school how we learn to memorize things? Hardly. In fact, if we look around the world, it is the indigenous unschooled peoples that have the best memories in the world. The North Queensland Aborigines, for example, recite a song by memory that takes five nights to complete. That's a long song. (laughs) Primitive peoples can observe a herd of several hundred animals and detect the absence of a single animal and know which one it is without counting. Many of their vocabularies are full of names for very detailed aspects of the world around them. I spent some time in Africa, uh, in Tanzania, and um, one of the places I was at had uh, a herd of cattle that was cared for by some Maasai herdsmen. Um, But overseeing the Maasai herdsmen was a volunteer from the U.S. So I was talking with this volunteer. I had shared some of this material. I was talking with this volunteer um, who was in charge of the livestock program. And she said, you know, that's absolutely correct. She said, we can bring a herd of 70 cows to the watering hole in the evening. And one of our herdsmen will look at it and say, such and such a cow's missing. And she said, my curiosity got the best of me one time. And I said, how do these guys memorize all these cows? And so she asked them, how do you guys learn each cow? And they looked at her like, how do you not know the cow is missing? (laughs) And they didn't go to school to learn how to memorize cows, right? I mean, this was a a common knowledge for them. They didn't need to sit down with a book um, memorizing the cows. Well, and here's, here's how it works. This is explained quite well. The schooled person depends heavily on external signs, such as the written word or Google, to hold, no- <laughs> I added that, to hold knowledge for him. The primitive native depends on memory. Every detail of a landscape is remembered with what seems to be a photographic memory, even the first time passing through. Though most children have an eidectic memory, it is rare among schooled adults, but not among primitive non-schooled adults. I have a friend who um, 
gave a, uh, a presentation, a message. I, I don't remember the country, but it was a, it was a primitive country, um, a third world country, and he gave a message. And then a couple of years later, he visited the country again, the same church, the same group of people, and he asked them, how many of you remember what I talked about last time I was here? Thinking, you know, nobody's going to remember that two years ago. And several people raised their hand, and he, and he asked one of the gentlemen, what was it? And he said, well, do you want the whole, let me tell you the whole sermon? Or would you like just, just the synopsis? The man remembered the sermon verbatim. And he wasn't the only one in the group. Are we wanting to help our children memorize scripture and learn to remember things well? Putting them in school, forcing them to memorize things for the test is not going to help build their memories. Quickly here, what about the effect on boys, though? Because of the two-year lag, I I hate calling it a lag, because of the two-year difference (laughs) in brain development in boys compared to girls, all the effects we've just discussed are intensified in boys. Our educational system suits girls a little better than it does boys, a lot better than it does boys. Um, We now know, um, actually this is uh, Michael Gurian, one of the foremost researchers on boys' issues today, and he tells us that boys today are not learning as well as girls. Boys receive 70% of the Ds and Fs given all students. Boys cause 90% of discipline problems. 80% of all high school dropouts are boys. Millions of American boys are on Ritalin and other mind-bending control drugs, and three out of four students labeled learning disabled are boys. Michael Gurian. Did God create boys to just be problems? No. No. He created them to be the spiritual leaders of their families. And Satan has a masterpiece here in creating an environment that is damaging the spiritual leaders of our families, damaging their their brain development. Um, The right hemisphere is busy developing during the first year, eight years of life in girls, but often the first 10 or even 12 years in boys. And this places them at an even greater academic disadvantage than their female counterparts. Reading skills, though. What about reading skills? Don't children need to learn reading early on so that they have good reading skills later on? Definitely not. According to the Early Childhood Research Quarterly, the foundation of later reading, and in particular reading comprehension, is flashcards, Sesame Street, vocabulary lists. No. What's the foundation? Read it with me. Language. How do we build good language skills? Speaking, (laughs) talking together, conversation, learning to read. Let's talk together. We'll lay the foundation. Use books and reading as a source of gaining needed information about something. Whoever invented the Dick and Jane reading series was trying to make kids bored, I think. (laughs) Who cares about Dick and Jane? (laughs) Let's read something interesting. Um, Use those biographies, the Bible stories, the list of reading and Uh, interesting reading sources we have is endless. Use good reading sources. It's better to do than to read, though, in early childhood. Rather than reading about doing something, go and actually experience it. Learning to read naturally can come at any time. It might come at five. Not saying we should teach it at five, but some children learn to read on their own. By five or six, that's perfectly fine. Be careful with eye development, though. Don't allow them to read for long periods of time because you can damage the eye development. But it might be five, it might be eight, it might be 10, it might be 12. By the time they're in their later teen years, you won't even know the difference though. Learning to read fluently does not take several years. In fact, a study was done and it um, takes about 30 contact hours if the brain is ready to learn reading to a college proficient level. 30 hours. What's the average work week? (laughs) 40, right? I'm not saying they're going to learn to read in a week, but actual instructional hours. And I've seen children learn to read in far less than 30 instructional hours. I've met many parents who came up to me and said, well, my child just started reading one day. And I said, hey, wait, that was my job. I was supposed to teach you to read. <laughs> but they picked it up through everyday life. Be intentional, you know, noticing words, explaining. When they ask the questions, answer them. You don't have to you know, lock the books up and prevent them from ever looking at a word. But... Um, Don't stress about trying to teach them reading. They did a study, again, from the Early Childhood Research Quarterly, one of the best um, sources for early childhood um, research. They found that an earlier reading instruction age, that's what the RIA stands for there, reading instruction age, the earlier reading instruction age group 
had initially superior letter naming, non-word, word, and passage reading, but this difference in reading skill disappeared by age 11. The later RIA had generally greater reading comprehension. They were comparing two groups, one who started the reading instruction at age 5, another who started at age 7. The ones who started later had better reading comprehension. They actually charted their average decoding and reading fluency. We see here on the far left, those starting at age 5 in the blue. By age 6, there's a few that evidently have taught themselves how to read because this other group had not entered the reading instruction yet. Then at age 7, we see the third uh, graph there pointing to it right here. At age 7, we saw the... Uh, the next group of students begin to come in. But look at the next one. Look at age 8, how quickly they're catching up. Look at age 9, they're almost caught up. And then look at age 10 and 11. They've passed them up. Literally two years wasted. They ended up better in the long run by starting two years later. And they charted this over a longer period of time and found that the later readers' abilities just kept growing, whereas the ones who started earlier their abilities would begin to plateau. They looked at Montessori schools, and they found, well, sure, they had an advantage in reading over the public school children at age 5, but not by the time they reached age 12. So they concluded and said, our findings suggest that success at reading is not assured by an earlier beginning. But, you ask, won't my child be left behind? How will they ever catch up? I mean, I suppose... If you wait till they're 10 and you put them in kindergarten and keep them locked in year by year, then yes, they'll be behind. <laughs> but that's not the point here. Children who start academics after age 8 usually end up far ahead of their early starters because when they're given time for their minds to develop, they will experience much less frustration when the academics do begin and will learn much faster because they are ready to learn it. How does this work? I had an example, and it just left my mind. <laughs> um, so essentially what's happening here is, again, we're not starting at age 10 and keeping them locked in year by year. The principle here is that they reach the age, first of all, they've learned a lot of things in their daily life that has laid the foundation. A lot of skills, a lot of academic skills can be taught in everyday life. Take, think of all the fractions you can learn in the kitchen, for example. And so the children are learning in everyday life. When they start school, they... Um, Quickly, quickly catch up. They don't, they don't stay grade by grade. And um, the teacher, if it's a good teacher, or the parent, will recognize what areas needs to be taught, what areas the child already knows, and they'll quickly move on. Let's suppose, um, let's just use an example here, that you start in first grade with addition of ones. So two plus four, those sort of addition problems. Because the brain isn't quite ready for it, we're pushing them and we have them do endless exercises just as school usually does. And eventually they reach the end of the year that, okay, they finally understand this concept. I'm sorry to the teachers here. I realize this is probably not um, true that, you know, it's addition of ones for all the first year and, and second grade is, is addition of tens. But I'm just using this for illustration purposes. So suppose we move on from first grade addition to ones, and now we have second grade addition of tens. We have 11 plus 12, those sort of math problems. Again, exercise after exercise because we're having to teach them to memorize it. In grade two um, ends, and they finally learn this concept. Grade three comes around. You have to do a bunch of review from the previous two years. And so finally, you get started on addition of hundreds, and you learn that for grade three. And then grade four, you finally reach addition of thousands. So by the time they're, what, nine or ten, you've reached this addition of thousands concept. And I, I realize this may not be not precisely correct in the teaching um, world and what they are teaching in school, but understand the illustration here. Suppose, though, you wait until that child is age 10. Can they, by common sense, understand addition of ones? Yeah, if they haven't been living under a rock, they will understand that <laughs> because it's, it's just normal everyday life to add things up. And um, maybe they've learned it in, in the kitchen or the sh workshop or wherever. It, it's a very con common thing to understand. And so, you know, you review this and all you're doing is transferring what they already know to paper. And so in five minutes, they've got this concept on paper. And uh, 10 minutes later, they've got the hundreds and, and moved on to the thousands. And so within an hour, you've taught everything that could have taken four years to learn. And again, this is just a simple illustration, but do you understand what I mean by them catching up? 
we're not saying, okay, 10 years old, you start with addition of, of ones and we're locking them in year by year. Of course, they're going to be behind that way. We are capitalizing on the brain's natural desire to learn and grow, and they're, they're learning these things in everyday life. So when it t- comes time to put it on paper, it's just common sense. It's just normal for them, and they're quickly up to, up to speed. But really, I, I hate even saying that they're catching up because we're comparing that to a worldly standard of where children should be. We don't need to compare them to that. We need to compare them to God's standard. In the study of 300 individuals who started school at about age 8 or later, all of them quickly caught up with their classes and in most cases performed well above the class average. Sorry, I'm skipping a lot of information. You can get my DVD, uh, The Classroom of the Remnant. I'm just going, we are totally out of time. Literacy in America. Currently, we have... 14%. 14%. I was trying to find the percentage here on the notes. 14% are completely illiterate. 29% are low-level literate. 44% are intermediate literacy with only 13% fully literate. This is the current picture of literacy in America. This is the country that's pushing it earlier and earlier and earlier. Is it working? Compare this to Denmark, Finland, Scandinavian countries who start at age... Seven, eight, nine, they're almost 100% literacy. They're not struggling with these problems that we're facing. <clears throat> but lastly and most importantly, what about spirituality? This is what we care about here at this True Education Conference. How does the early formal academic environment impact a child's spirituality? Well, I uh, mentioned earlier that the right hemisphere, that should not say controls It is heavily involved with spiritual strength and understanding in a child. The early years, though, are a critical period for the right hemisphere. What is a critical period? They've done studies and found, um, without getting into the extent of the study, put it in a nutshell, there is a window of time when it comes to brain development for various learning experiences, various concepts and areas of development. And if we miss that window of time, we've... It's not, it hasn't become impossible for them to learn certain things, but it's become much more difficult. We've missed this critical window of time. The early years are a critical window for the right hemisphere. They need the early years for the development of spiritual strength. We know this from the spirit of prophecy, right? The first seven years are the time in which character is developed. Pressure to develop the left hemisphere also begins to suppress the development of the right hemisphere. Satan knew what he was doing here, as he's wanting to damage the future leaders and hinder the spiritual development of our boys to become men. He is damaging. He is replacing what is most important during the early years of a child's life. We need to be focusing on character development, and instead we're focusing on reading skills and math skills and academic skills that can just as easily be learned at a later date. And so, as we read earlier, in the early education of children, many parents and teachers fail to understand that the greatest attention needs to be given to the physical constitution that a healthy condition of body and mind may be secured. It has been the custom, is still the custom, to encourage children to attend school when they were mere babes needing a mother's care. Parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached 8 or 10 years of age. Does that line up perfectly with all the research we've just seen? Perfectly. It's amazing. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them God's great book of nature. There is a textbook that does not require close-up vision. The only schoolroom for children until 8 or 10 years of age should be in the open air, amid the opening flowers in nature's beautiful scenery, their most familiar textbook, The Treasures of Nature. These lessons, imprinted upon the minds of young children amid the pleasant, attractive scenes of nature, will not soon be forgotten. Did God know what what he was talking about when he gave us this counsel? (laughs) He did. He understood the brain development. He knew why we should do this. Unfortunately, it's taken us this long to um, garner this research, but I would like to ask the question, you know, there are other things we read in the Spirit of Prophecy about what we should do with children. Are we going to wait until we have the research that backs those up to follow it? Or are we just going to take on faith? We've seen enough here that says the Lord knew what he was talking about. 
Are we going to move forward based on what he's told us? Or are we going to wait until we have to, it has to be proven to us beyond the shadow of a doubt? I encourage you to read the books like Child Guidance, Christian Education, Fundamentals of Christian Education, Education, Adventist Home, Special Testimonies on Education, Studies in Christian Education. The list is endless of the counsel that we have. Read it and apply it because God knows what he's talking about. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the time we've had. Thank you for the research that backs up what you have told us. But forgive us, Lord, for not following your counsel on faith. I pray you'll help us to embrace the principles that you have given us and follow wholeheartedly. Uh, Please, we ask your blessing on the remainder of our day and the many things that we will learn and experience together. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.